This episode of The Ride is brought to you by Bymeda. Bymeda might be the biggest animal health company you've never heard of, till now. Bymeda's products have been trusted by veterinarians and owners since the 1960s, when our Irish roots began. Bymeda is one of the largest producers of dewormers, like Equimax, Bimectrin, and Exodust. World-renowned equine athletes also rely on polyglycan, a patented formula that replaces lost or damaged synovial fluid, and Confidence EQ pheromone gel, which reduces and prevents equine stress. Consult your vet and visit bymedaus.com to see where to buy. Thanks again to Bymeda for sponsoring this episode of The Ride. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of The Ride. This is Nicole. I'm here with my co-host Jillian and today we are sitting down with Annie Kennedy who actually happens to be a co-worker of ours and also the host of the Ask Annie podcast and we wanted to have Annie on this podcast today because she has just recently transitioned over to riding western after many many years of being in the English saddle and we kind of wanted to get, you know, an idea of what brought Annie into the Western world, how she's loving it. I even drug her to a Cody Crow video shoot where she got to participate with her new horse. And so, yeah, thank you, Annie, for coming on and talking with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You really summed up my journey <laughs> really well. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, Annie is one of our coworkers. She does so much for for so many things, um, especially on the horse and rider brand. You do what we're working with us on horse and rider on demand. I know that you do some behind the scenes work for horse and riders. So, really, we would not be here without Annie. But Annie, I you know we love talking about how much we love you having you to work with. But I think our reader, our listeners, would love to know more about how your horse journey even started. Sure. Well, I've been riding for a really long time. My mom was into horses um, and really passed along that bug to me. Um, I started out in 4-H and I actually had an awesome little quarter horse gelding um, and he did everything I possibly wanted to do on him. He would he would jump for me. We would do trail courses. Um, we did a competitive trail ride, which wasn't really our thing, but we tried it. Um, and I really um, loved getting to, you know, kind of dip my toe into everything with him. Um, then I got into my teenage years and really fell in love with jumping. So I got a, a perch around thoroughbred and I started doing eventing with her. And I was totally hooked on that, like a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. So um, that was really, really fun for me. I uh, rode there through um, high school and then I went to Colorado State University for college and I was able to bring her with me um, my sophomore summer, uh, so about halfway through. Um, and I also played polo at CSU, which was an awesome learning experience, <laughs> really, really neat opportunity that I had there. Um, and then I came to work with uh, Nicole and Jillian at uh, the Equine Network. And um, honestly, a lot of my coworkers really had a big influence on me, like wanting to try Western again. You know, I'd kind of done the equitation stuff in 4-H and it was really fun and I enjoy like the precision of patterns and things like that. Um, but they really opened my eyes to cow things. <laughs> and I didn't really know that that sort of thing existed. And so, yeah, like Nicole said, I recently got a little uh, quarter horse gelding. He's a little bit cowy, so we're really trying to start on that kind of thing. And, um, yeah, just, just kind of seeing where it goes. That's so fun. And I think it's really cool that, you know, you, you kind of have a background in everything now. You know, you've, you've done all of the English stuff, so now you're branching off into Western. So it, was it just, like, watching all of the horse and rider on demand videos that you were like oh that's like really fun or you know like what kind of other than your coworkers, you know probably guilt tripping you into riding western what <laughs> what made you decide to make the switch 
Yeah, that's a good question. Honestly, I was a little bit nervous about it because I have been like a solid English writer for a while now. Um, and really just, um, yeah, just seeing that I would be successful in the Western arena after being in the English arena for so long. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, would see pictures of things in horse and rider and like getting a sample of the on-demand things. Like I noticed that there were a lot of similar like fundamentals um, in watching the on-demand videos and, uh, you know, like having your horse on your outside aids, like that is something in the English arena, like inside leg to outside aids, like that is a thing that we do all the time. And like learning that is also the case in the Western arena in a different like set of set of tasks but same same end result um that was really like comforting to me because I wasn't like starting over brand new I was kind of just like changing a little bit of how I did things um in the western ring so yeah I think that's something that people don't really note notice when they're you know looking at the two different disciplines it's like so many of the fundamentals are similar so before I came to horse and rider I was working down um, in West Palm, Florida with doing hunter jumper and dressage stuff. And I really didn't know anything about those disciplines until I started working down there. And I, after watching it, I was like, a lot of this is just so similar. It looks so different, but really it's, it's, and it was really fascinating to me. I loved just like kind of comparing the different, you know, they call everything different, but a side pass is a side pass, you know, no matter (laughs) what kind of saddle you're doing it in and, and things like that. So that's something that, um, I always found really interesting and I, I think that you're right. It'll make the transition a little less daunting probably. I think I've always like told people who are just getting started in the horse showing or just riding. Most of the people that I've, I worked with or was around were, were in the horse show industry, but they'd always come over and, and they wouldn't know anything or they wrote English. And I would quite honestly say like, it's having an English background is such a great thing to have and it's it really is easy to transition over to the western if you have that English background and and I think I mean Annie you did the three-day eventing so you did a little bit of dressage I'm aware that uh three-day eventing dressage is a little different from you know traditional dressage but uh you know we talk all the time with people like Warwick Schiller and you know other I have a couple of other reigning trainers Ryan uh Ryan Rushing you know he came from the dressage world and and having that background I mean we use so many dressage, you know, maneuvers and, and elements. And, you know, we might not call them what the dressage people are calling them, but essentially we are all doing the same thing, just in different saddles, in different arenas. You know, you might be going over a fence while I'm trying to get a sliding stop or, or chase a cow down the arena or, or whatever. It's, it's all, it all, all has the same fundamentals though. So yeah, that transition over seems like it was a very, natural transition um minus the fact that annie loves to post at the trot uh (laughs) she got in trouble at our last at our video shoot for posting at the trot he's like you can't stop your horse if you're you're up in the saddle yeah yep (laughs) i know a lot of riders that have made that transition and that's like their biggest problem is immediately when they feel the trot they just start posting it's like sit down like you can't you can't do that (laughs) you can't post in the horsemanship (laughs) Oh man, it just comes naturally. Like I don't even think about it. I'm like, oh yeah, sit on my pockets. That's that's <laughs> the biggest thing that that's the biggest obstacle for me so far is just like making sure my seat is deep because when you ride English, you're taught to sit on your pelvic bones and you know have a very upright seat and be very light. And in the cow horse, you really have to like tuck down under, and that is very difficult. It's a mental thing that I have to remember to physically tell myself to sit down. So, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I know that you haven't actually done any like cow work in the arena. I know you've, you've been like playing around and and helping people with, you know, cattle, you know, pushing them and moving them around and all that. But when you're going down the fence and if you're not sitting really, really deep in that saddle, and this is coming from someone who has made this mistake, when they go to make that hard turn, your butt's just going to go flying (laughs) over. And (laughs) Uh, yeah, it, it gets a little, uh, uncoordinated when you're not sitting deep in the saddle. I've learned that from my own mistakes. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I'm not quite ready for <laughs> real cattle yet. That's something that I noticed even coming, you know, like I, 
primarily did horsemanship and equitation and things like that. And then once I started taking some reining lessons, it was like, I was not used to sitting so deep and like, it doesn't matter where your legs are and things like that. And so for a sliding stop, I was like, I can't, like, it's not that much different. And if you're not sitting right, it's, it's a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> so Annie, tell us a little bit more about the horse that you just got and uh, what your kind of goals are in the future with it. Yeah, so he's a nine-year-old quarter horse. I actually uh, got him from one of our coworkers. Um, so I've been riding him a little bit off and on this summer. Um, and he's <laughs> he's little compared to my eventer. So <laughs> um, seeing them in the paddock next to each other is quite the sight. <laughs> um, but he's probably right at 15 hands. Um, so I guess pretty average size for um, cow horse things. Um he has a phenomenal start. Like he has all of his basics there. He is ready, primed and ready to go any way that I want him to. And he has a fantastic brain. Um, if he doesn't get something, he doesn't get frustrated. He just like gets a little anxious, like, oh, where did you want me to go? I didn't know. And so you like show him the path and he gets it immediately. And that's been really cool to like work with a horse like that again. Um, Cause I haven't had a you know, malleable younger horse like that in a while. Um, so getting to like kind of figure out things together has been really awesome. And he's pretty patient with me. So um, like Nicole was talking about the stops and um, we were working on the, at this recent um, horse rider on demand shoot on having straight, like purposeful stops. And I, again, I wasn't sitting on my pocket and I asked him to stop and he stopped very square and like, did stop and it was fine. And Cody was like, okay, the next time let's plan for this stop. And so like three strides out, I want you to start counting down your, your strides to your stop, which like immediately clicked in my head again, like on, you know, focusing on different disciplines, but like, of course I count jump strides. Like I have to count distances. So I know how to do that. So immediately I was like, okay, prepare three strides out. And I like, you know, sat in my driving seat and prepared and prepared and prepared and then asked Z to stop. And he totally tucked under and like had a much more of like balanced, ready to go stop. And it was really cool because I didn't know that I wasn't asking him correctly and he might not have known what he could do. <laughs> um, and then when we got it together, it was exactly what we were going for. So he's really, he's really fun because he is like ready and like, you know, ready to, to do what you want him to do all the time. And I really like that in a horse. Now you're, co you kind of talked a little bit about the Cody, uh, I don't want to say clinic, the, the, um, one-on-one -on -one lesson that you did with him for the video shoot, which people will be able to see eventually. Um, but yeah, that was kind of your first big, like one-on-one -on -one training session with like a true performance horse western professional you've worked with cody a little bit in the past but it was usually with group lessons with friends and and everybody's horses were green and it was kind of more of like a let's go have let's go do something fun together whereas this one was like a true like here's what you got to do to get ready for the horse show arena and what was that kind of like i mean how did you feel after that yeah so i like nicole said i have taken a couple group lessons with cody but i've never had one-on-one -on -one um, lessons with him. So it was really, really awesome to just have like all of the focus and be able to work on exactly what I thought that we needed to work on. And it was really interesting because what I thought we needed to work on led to like more fundamental things that I needed to work on. Um, and I think this is really common in writing. We all want to like get to that next level. And it, we sometimes are a little bit lax on the like fundamentals and building blocks. And especially with uh, like greener horse I want to make sure that like his fundamentals are there so that as we keep building he doesn't just fall out from underneath me one day or in a maneuver or something like that so like having Cody being able to work with Cody and breaking down the things that like I really needed to work on and like finding tools that I could do at home like the amount of times that I've done that drill already <laughs> um, at home since that lesson a week ago, like, and the improvements that have been made, that's really awesome. And I like being able to like take things, um, from my lessons with him and being able to try them at home and then coming back and like reporting back on how I did or like what I found difficult. Um, yeah. Um, so I, you said that 
you know, your eventing horses are so much bigger than your new Western horse. So like how, how tall are they compared to your 15 hand quarter horse? And like what I, I, that must be such a different feeling like to sit and the gates and everything. What's, what has that been like? Yeah, it's so different. Um, so my eventer is a percher on thoroughbred. So she's big everywhere. Um, she's built, she's a little, has a little bit of a baroque neck from the Percheron and she's tall and has long legs like the thoroughbred. Um, and so seeing that, like she's, she's probably about 16 hands, maybe a little bit over 16. So she's not like in- incredibly tall, but eventers, I mean, can be up to 17 hands. Um, but just her like body stature and presence is really different than Z's. Who's my, who's my quarter horse Z. Um, he, you know, he's put together really well too, but he's a little bit more refined and he's got a little bit more of a dainty head and smaller, more refined legs. And, um, even like their, their muscling is different. You know, she's got this huge top line and this huge round hind quarter and big, big muscles everywhere. And he's a little bit more like lean. He, he has like really nice shoulder muscles and like really chiseled hind quarter muscles, um, but just so like comparing what they do and like their body functionality to each other is pretty, pretty cool to, to see. So is there a moment in your kind of riding career where like, is there just like a memory that sticks out on like something that you use to this day for your own personal riding philosophy? I know that you're not a horse trainer, but you know, you do a lot of the riding yourself. You're a DIYer, you know, you keep your horses at home. Was there a, like some kind of advice given or just like a moment where everything kind of clicked that you kind of cling on to and use in your riding career to this day? Yeah. Um, so I, I got pretty competitive really young. And so I think when you do that, you, as a kid, you really, really want to like attain things and like get to the next level and being a youth competitor is really competitive and you haven't really found out who you are as a person yet. So you cling to like your success in the show ring. And that would translate into my like really hot horse as just like chaotic sometimes, like, cause we would both just be really, really intense about like getting to whatever that next step was. Um, And so one of my trainers growing up um, told me that I needed to be like water She was like, your horse is going to be hot. Things are going to happen. But she was like, you need to ride like water. You need to adjust to what's happening. You need to like be there for your horse, but not be, you know, a controlling micromanagerial rider. You need to just flow. And like, I try to do that in, it's, it's crucial in eventing because if you don't adapt, like really bad things can happen in cross country and really ugly things can happen in with show jumping and the dressage, but like, it's a safety factor. If you don't adapt, then something really bad's going to happen. And it also helps, um, like the mental state of both of my horses. Like I, I've found that if I get really intense and really, really, um, precise about something, both of them now Z too, like it's happened a couple of times and I, he, he gets like tense and you can sense it. And I need, I, then I take that into myself and remind myself, no, like, we're just going to like ride the horse you have today, be like water, be with the flow. Good things will happen. You know, I'm not saying that like you don't need to work hard and like push to the next level, but like just learning how to adapt and ride the horse that you have, I think would be my main, main point. It's cool how that advice can transfer over to so many different disciplines, you know, and that's definitely something that I think we've all probably dealt with is, you know, having to adapt to your horse and not pushing them too hard that their brain gets, you know, frazzled and overwhelmed and things like that. So that's, that's definitely shows how important that is that, you know, in in every discipline, that's something that people are paying attention to. So what are your plans, you know, for the future with your horse? So do you showing something that you want to do, or is it more just like, learning to ride in that discipline for fun or, you know? Yeah. So I, I am really competitive. And so I don't think that that's going to be something that I lose. Um, but like, as I've gotten older, I've really tried to like find the joy in just like riding my horse and trying to, you know, work towards personal goals instead of like actually like 
you know, set show goals. Um, so I, I want to work with um, my new horse for the rest of the winter, you know, working through the winter. And then I do want to, I, I can't help but want to <laughs> go to some competitions um, this next summer. Uh, but Colorado has a really good, like, introductory cow program I've found or I've heard about. Um, so I think that I'll probably start there and, you know, see how competitive we are, really see what we need to work on, too, because I don't want to get in over my head and rattle us both. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I definitely want to compete, um, but I'm, I really, really want to make sure that we're competitive and competent before doing that. I have the same... I don't think it's a problem, but same thing where I'm super competitive and like, I just want to show and do it and be a part of it, but it's not, you know, right now it's not practical for me to go show my green horse, you know, it's, that would just be a waste of money and put a bad experience, you know, in his brain. But, um, I know exactly how you feel. Cause I just like, I just want to go show so bad and I love <laughs> the competitive aspect of it, but it's definitely hard not being able to do that but it's also really you know it's I think it's good making making me kind of refocus and like you said work on personal goals that aren't necessarily related to the show pen or being competitive just you know things to improve on and things like that so it's been a fun experience dealing with that but I'm definitely excited to be going back to the show pen soon <laughs> I totally agree and I think too like switching disciplines I also want to like make myself proud like I don't want to be like the eventer that goes to a cow horse show like I want to be a cow horse competitor so I I really want that for my myself my like own personal um yeah goals I, I want to have that before I go take him someplace so yeah I, well, I think it's really smart that you kind of acknowledge that and you know have found a intro you know show program to kind of get your feet wet before just diving right in I think that will make you and your horse so much more comfortable with you know starting out and everything like that so that's um definitely a good a good place to start so Annie going back to kind of your previous experiences with horses is there a horse that really sticks out to you that kind of helped you become the rider you are today yes i I think that the, the, the mare I have now, um, I've had her for 13 years. Uh, so I got her when she was six. Um, so we, I've been through so much with her and she has really shaped me into the rider that I am. Um, you know, we, we both have a lot of quirks and we're both, um, you know, pretty opinionated, strong women. And I think really like learning how to ride a horse like that was huge, huge in my riding abilities. Um, you know, you have to, like I said earlier, like you have to adapt, but then you also have to be like the strong, confident, like, yeah, we're going to this jump and we're going to jump it. And, you know, you have to have both of that, but you can't have that when, like something bad is going to happen. Like you really, it like riding, riding her has really shaped me like mentally, emotionally, physically <laughs> into the rider that I am. Um, yeah. Just because she, she required a lot. Like, you know, she was young when I started riding her and she helped me progress to the levels that I'm at now. And that's huge in itself. Um, but, but I really had to learn how to ride a really hot young horse and it's it's pretty cool actually I wrote her this morning um and she's 21 now which is just wild um but she is like she's the most telling horse I've ever ridden like you put your leg one centimeter out of place and she swings her hips over like she is the most like noodly flexible <laughs> um responsive horse that I've ever ridden which has also made me a good rider because like you have to be so body aware every time you ride her like even even if I'm just riding her bareback like around the property like she she's so responsive and I think being that body aware has really helped me ride other horses because I know you know exactly what I'm doing exactly the cue that I'm giving and so I'm not gonna like you know give give something that's either like a horse isn't gonna know or isn't gonna like um 
misinterpret or, you know, anything like that. Like I know exactly where my body is at all times. And I think honestly, like it's made a huge difference in transitioning because, you know, I, yeah, I might be sitting a little bit different, but I know exactly like the pressure points that I'm giving, like through my saddle and through my legs and everything like that because of her, like, because if I was tight in one of my thighs, like she would be going a different direction than I wanted, I wanted her to go. So like, yeah, she's, she's definitely shaped me into the rider that I am. And, um, like, I just feel like, uh, like the horses that I continue to ride are just going to be like her legacy. Cause I'm just going to be, you know, taking everything that I've learned over this lifetime with her, um, into these other horses. So now you mentioned that Maddie is now in her twenties. Um, a lot of our listeners and then the horse and rider readers have senior horses and, and their senior horses are really important to them. And, uh, have you noticed that your your care for her has changed as she's gotten older or, or what's been the secrets to keeping her happy and obviously healthy? I mean, because you're still riding her. You're not competing on her. You know, she she has a very easy riding schedule, but you're still doing stuff with her. So that's I mean, that's a huge success. And it's very telling to to your program at home. Yeah, I like she has aged really well. I'm really thankful, but I think in part because I've kept her um, working up through her late teen years. Um, I brought her to college when she was 12. Um, So, you know, prime, prime riding abilities then. Um, But I haven't, besides like the jumping, like in the past, like three years or so, I haven't really jumped her much just because I don't really think she has anything to prove to me. Um, she doesn't need to do that. I think that if I were to put her on her fence, she would a hundred percent like go for it and be excited about it. Um, but besides that, I've really tried to keep her like training program pretty similar, just shortened a little bit. So like, I don't ride her for an hour. I usually ride her for half an hour to 40 minutes tops. Um, I don't usually try to like really make her sweat. I do a lot of like lateral and like thinking drills with her. Um, I think that lateral work has, I mean, and she's a really, really flexible horse anyway, and, you know, has a lot, a lot of give everywhere. Um, But lateral work for her is so great because it not only keeps her like muscles toned and her like AIDS responsive, but it also keeps her mind really sharp because she can't second guess and be like, oh, we're going to trot in a 20 meter circle. Like, oh no, we're going to do hips in on 20 meter circle. And then halfway around, we're going to do shoulders in and then we're going to have pass over and like just keeping her like mentally sharp has really, really been important um, in our exercise program. I'd say like, as far as maintenance goes, I really don't try to like um, push anything that I do with her. Like I don't trailer her for long distances. I, you know, don't let her stand out in the cold without a blanket for a second longer than she has to. Um, which like, she probably would be fine with all of that, but I just don't see the need in putting any extra stress on her. Um, so yeah, I think really just, I think it's important to like watch them and like understand like where they're at physically and mentally, but if they're not like, if there's not a physical ailment, that's like making them not be able to work. I think that like keeping them in work as long as you can in like work asterisks being you know shorter more condensed um less stressful um situations um is really important and it's really kept her you know aware it's kept her body in shape um so yeah I just I just say keep keep us pretty like keep up with your training and riding on your senior horses um and then yeah just just trying to make their lives easy where you can so yeah, I agree that keeping them working is so important. You know, every I've had a couple of older horses and they just, you know, as soon as they stop working, I feel like is when you start seeing them like make a major decline. My gelding that was 20 something when I retired him and then he was a lesson horse for about a year. And then as soon as he started having some soundness problems and things like that, and as soon as we stopped, like that's when he really started declining and it was just very obvious so it's it's really important like you said to just keep watching them and be aware of you know maybe they need to be working a little bit less but still keeping them in shape and things like that so what's 
what's kind of your training routine for your new horse? Like, what are you bringing into his routine? Yeah. So I really want, um, I really want his top line to evolve. Um, so in the English disciplines, like that's what you work for all the time. Like you just strive for that top line. And I'm learning a lot more about like self carriage and, um, just overall, um, body position for horses in the Western disciplines. And so working through that, I'm really like, again, figuring out that a lot of the drills that I worked on to get my English horses top lines, um, you know, developed are really important and could really help Z in a lot of the things that we're working on. So like, he doesn't have like a huge hindquarter yet, which like, I don't really want him to be like beefy, but I want him to have like a well-developed, um, hindquarter. And so we've got a couple hills on our property. And so at the end of every ride, I do some hill work and I just trot hills for like 10, 15 minutes, like depending on how exhausted he is in the arena. Um, but I think that like, you know, getting him to use his hind end in a natural state like that, where I'm not having to like micromanage him and, you know, put him into frame, just, you know, showing him that his body can work for him. Um, that's been something that I've added recently. Um, another thing that we've really been working on, um, with him is like overall body control, um, because he has really good, he's, he's really responsive. He just doesn't necessarily like know sometimes where to put his body. (laughs) And so like we worked on a little bit uh, this past lesson with Cody with like breaking out each individual, um, like body maneuver. And so like we would move the shoulders first and then we'd move the rib cage and then we move the haunches. And so like they all can be set. I think like teaching Z that all of his body parts can be separated and he can move them independently um, because he can, he's really athletic. Um, but just like helping him understand that um, he can move all those different aspects and, and that I'm here as his rider to like help him know where to put each of those aspects. Um, one of the drills that we were working on is a lead change drill. And while like Z and I aren't quite ready for our flying lead changes yet, like I really, again, want to like get the fundamentals in place so that when we are ready, it's going to be really easy and not stressful for him um, in the long run. And so it was really, really telling because we would, you know, have to at first move um, our shoulders. And at some points he would be fine. And then at other points you would really have to get after him. So like teaching him that he can move his shoulders over. And then in that same breath, like switch and move his haunches over. It's really, really something that I want to work on with him um, to, to, you know, start to separate out those different cues and different maneuvers um, so that in the future we can be better. Yeah, and that um, lead change drill that Annie was kind of talking about is something that she did on camera at Cody's. So um, anybody who is a subscriber to On Demand um, will be able to watch that when it releases. But yeah, I loved I loved that drill. I know um, when we were planning this video shoot and I was talking to Annie because she's ridden with Cody in the past. And, you know, I was like, well, what what kind of stuff do you really love when you go to Cody's? Like, what is some of your favorite takeaways? And she was like, the lead change drill. So <laughs> of course we had to include the lead change drill into our video shoot. And I'm really glad I, we did because I do, I, I love it. Um, it's not really a lead change drill. It's more of a homework you need to do before you even attempt a lead change. So I think it's really beneficial for everybody. Um, but anyway, you also have an equine focused podcast called Ask Annie. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about it and what you what you do and, and what's coming up in the future for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so your audience might have actually heard about it because I am happy to have a home on Horse and Rider um, website. So the podcast lives there. And like Nicole said, it's the Ask Annie podcast. And I review horse products and then give uh, a five to 10 minute review on how that product worked in my everyday horse life. Um, So horse products can be expensive. Um, You know, sometimes you aren't able to go and try something out at a tack shop. Um, So that's where I come in and I take it and I tell you how it works. 
um, tell you some of the unique aspects that I found with it, and then, you know, really explain how it fits into my equestrian lifestyle. Um, and it's been really fun. It's been going on for about two and a half years now, which is just wild. Um, so uh, recently, we've started branching out more into having um, representatives from the brands come on the podcast, which is really, really interesting because, you know, we see all these products on the shelves. We know the, you know, the name recognition on these products, um, but it's really cool to learn about like how the product got to where it is. And the only people that can tell that story are the, you know, individuals behind the brands, the, the people actually working on the product. So it's really, really cool to get like their takes and it's incredible how much goes into product development. Like sometimes I take for granted, like, Oh, I'm just going to go, you know, buy this detangler off the shelf and it's great and it works great. And that's it. (laughs) But there's, you know, years and hours and, you know, countless people that have gone into making sure that like that detangler is exactly what you need. And it's really cool to hear that um, from the individuals behind the brand. So We've been doing a couple of those lately, and I I really enjoy those. So, Annie, before we let you go, uh, where can people? I mean, I know you said that uh, Ask Annie is actually on Horse and Rider's website, but where can they follow you on social media? Where can they they reach out to you? Um, you know, all that fun stuff. Yeah. So, um, online on Horse and Rider's website or under the podcast tab, and then uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Ask Annie Podcast. And then if you, if any of your listeners have any products that they'd like me to try or ones that they've really found that they love, um, have them shoot me a note about it. My email is askanniepodcast at gmail.com and I'll try and get it featured on the show or we can have a good conversation about good products. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on here and talking with us. We were so excited to have you on. for tuning into the ride podcast we hope you enjoyed this episode and please be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts follow horse and rider magazine on social media and find us at horseandrider.com if you guys have any questions or comments please be sure to hit us up at horse and rider at equine network.com we want to hear from you guys and if you like what you're listening to be sure to leave us a review on itunes Once again, thanks to this episode's sponsor, Bymeda.